All right, it is 7.02, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Sarah Walker, the Walden Woods Project's Education Director. Thank you so much for joining us for our event with Bill Muma, Climate Change, What Would Thorough Say? For those that do not know us, the Walden Woods Project is a nonprofit based out of Lincoln, Massachusetts. We preserve the land, literature, and legacy of Henry David Thoreau to foster an ethic of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Our organization was founded in 1990 by recording artist Don Henley, and this April we celebrated our 32nd anniversary. And this event is also sponsored by Restore the North Woods. Restore is a nonprofit membership organization founded in 1992 by veteran conservationists and grassroots roots activists. They are grassroots based using advocacy, public education and citizen activism to address the root causes of our ecological crisis. The mission of Restore is to create new national parks, save natural forests and protect endangered wildlife. And for some Zoom housekeeping, this is a Zoom webinar, so you are only able to see the host and the panelists. Please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen if you're having tech difficulties and someone will try to help you out. And you can also use the chat to correspond with each other. If you would like closed captioning, you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. There will be an audience Q&A during the last 15 minutes or so of our event. Please, you, please enter any questions throughout in the Q&A box, which is different from the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen, and we will address them when it is time. And now I will turn the program over to Michael Kellett, who is the Executive Director of Restore, and he will introduce tonight's topic and speaker. So now over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for being on to, to see this event. Um, and the, the subject is climate change, what would Toro say? And I'm, I'm very uh, honored to uh, introduce William Muma, who is Professor Emeritus at Tufts, Tufts University. He's a climate scientist who's published research on the transition to renewable energy. He was a lead author on five intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, I, IPCC including the 2007 report they received the Nobel Peace Prize. He's worked for the past 15 years on the essential need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from land management and increase the removal of ad additional carbon dioxide by forests, wetlands, and soils. He was also a member of the original technical advisory group that made the recommendation for designating state forests as reserves, parklands, and woodlands. And I was also a part of that, so I can tell you it was a lot of hard work that he did, and it really made a big difference between, uh, because we have some important areas re that are reserves today. He's also been, I can say, uh, one of the leaders in connecting the science of climate change and forests to for regular people out there who don't read all these scientific journals. And it's really been important. His work has been important in bring, connecting the two and helping us lead to real positive change. So I'm very pleased to introduce him here and, and hear what Thora would say about climate change. Thank you very much, Michael. I really appreciate that. And so, as Sarah, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I, I as, as one who is who, who first read Thoreau many, many, many years ago and uh, returned to uh, his work often uh, for uh, ideas and inspiration. <clears throat> and when I was invited to present tonight, I I thought, well, you know, instead of just giving kind of a standard talk, I, I will do some of that too about uh, about climate change. But it occurred to me, what an opportunity! Um, you know, what would what would Henry David think about all this? And uh, I would um, um, hope that in the discussion we could talk a little bit about things like, uh, you know, uh, what would uh, Thoreau be thinking of, of what's happening today? After you, I will I will share some. Thoreauian statements, and I want to thank Michael for 
uh, sharing his, 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 I guess there are a bunch of us who keep lists of Thoreauian statements and uh, Michael shared his with me and it was very helpful. Um, and, and you know, would he be, um, would he be willing to adopt uh, solar panels or would he think that they were the wrong way to go? Would he focus, what would he really likely, likely focus on? So with that, let me just um, share my screen and um, okay, let's just see here and play from start. Okay, I think uh, I think that's working all right. Um, so what would he say? What would he do? What would he think about all this? This is of course highly speculative, um, but um, um, uh, he. He may not have even known about climate change, but he said a lot about preventing it um, without even knowing what it was. Just a little background history. Um, the hypothesis that an atmospheric component allowed the sun's light to penetrate the atmosphere but prevented the Earth's radiant heat from leaving, uh, thereby keeping the Earth warm, was first enunciated in 1827 uh, by a French physicist named Fourier. Uh, actually, there, his mathematical prowess is so great that we still use it today in a number of very important um, medical um, and, uh, machines and, um, and elsewhere. Um, he called it the greenhouse effect by analogy to the glass buildings in which plants are grown. And you're all familiar with how this works, so I won't spend much time with this, but the uh, sun's uh, uh, light comes through. It's visible light. We see it. Uh, some of it's reflected back into space by clouds and the ocean and other uh, light snow and ice. But um, a, a good portion of it ends up heating the land. And as the land heats up, it, it radiates back into space, the heat. And, you know, this is the phenomenon you have when you cross a, a, an asphalt, black asphalt road on a summer day. You just feel the heat radiating up and it's on its way back to outer space. But there are gases in the atmosphere, called, which we still call greenhouse gases, um, uh, that uh, absorb that uh, radiation. And over here on the right, you can see they re-radiate some of it back into space, but some of it back down again. And remarkably, uh, there are times, uh, there, well, every day, um, we actually receive more radiation from the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than we do directly from the sun, because there's so much energy built up there. So uh, today it would be called the hot car effect. When people started telling me they didn't believe in the greenhouse effect years ago, I said, do you believe in the hot car effect? And you all hear about this, and it really is a serious problem. Um, rolling up your windows and leaving a dog or a child in it can, is, is, is often fatal in a very short period of time. I think if it's 80 degrees outside and the windows are rolled up within a half an hour, it can be 125 and get more, and, and that's sort of your limit as to what you can stand. Um, um, well, here are, here, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas. And this just shows the record that we have going back. Actually, it starts two years earlier, but I see that they've now just started at 1960, so they can have evenly spaced uh, ticks on the graph. And you see it's been rising continuously and it has these little oscillations in it because in the summertime in the northern hemisphere, this was taken in the nor northern hemisphere, um, the um, uh, plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the air in our, our forests. And in the winter time, they're not doing that. So the amount in the atmosphere goes back up. And so we see the literally the breathing of the planet in the northern hemisphere with those wiggles. And um, if you if you look at the um, at the blue line back in at uh, the time of the industrial revolution about 1750, uh, it was the 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 atmospheric concentration was about uh, 278 uh, almost 280 uh, parts per million, meaning 280 air molecules out of a million were uh, carbon dioxide. And then you see the emissions that come with the, uh, the use of coal instead of uh, water power uh, for industry. And it rises up on the black line and it's now up here uh, somewhere, <clears throat> it's about 30, um, 
35, this is fossil fuels now uh, up here. And we had this dip for COVID and it's back up again. And you can see that this is, is uh, pretty, pretty close to going parallel here. I mean, the rise in the amount in the atmosphere is associated with this. There's another source, which is uh, um, um, emissions from uh, the biosphere, particularly from our deforestation, which add to this and bring it up, as you'll see, to about 39 billion tons. So indeed, the Earth, Earth is warmed. The uh, uh, zero line here is arbitrarily chosen between 1940 and 1980 because it's, it's, it's about as many cold, colder years as warmer years. And before that, they're all colder. And after that, after 1980, they're all warmer. And you can see that the very warmest years have been uh, uh, here in, um, at, the, at the end of the, of the 2000s and into the beginning of the 2020s. So uh, that's the, uh, what's happened. And, and the climate has already changed. There's just no question about it. Uh, this is just showing fires in California. This, I thought, really wonderful picture of a, of a guy in Death Valley in 2020 when it hit 130 degrees, um, uh, it, which, which was a record at the time. I think it may still be the record. Uh, for those of you who are longing to have um, a place by the ocean, uh, think twice about it. In 2018, in Situate Mass, this was just a regular storm um, that hit at very high tide with higher sea levels and engulf this whole house. And then there are pictures late, early, earlier this year of homes in uh, North Carolina just falling into the sea. Um, the droughts in the US in 2022 have been horrific. Um, we haven't had many of these intensified storms, but the storms that have occurred in the past few years are all, most, all stronger than they ever were before. Uh, if you think it was, uh, I don't know what was, what was raining in eastern Massachusetts. I'm out in Williamstown, but uh, we, we got a torrential downpour uh, uh, last night and uh, the night before. And um, indeed, 55% uh, more precipitation is falling in the top 1% of, of, of the snow and rain events uh, than it was, was the case in the late 1950s. And here's a German uh, flood that occurred um, uh, last year, and this, this was a village that's 800 years old or something, and it's never seen anything like this. And then, of course, Pakistan. Uh, these are uh, NASA pictures uh, from, from uh, uh, satellites on uh, the left. I mean, it's actually kind of a beautiful pattern. Uh, here are these uh, two rivers um, running through. Here's the agricultural region of, of Pakistan. And um, on August 24th, um, or August, no, it's August 20, 29th, I think it is, uh, it, uh, it looks like this. It's just 30% uh, of the country is, is uh, underwater. If 30% of the US were underwater, it would be probably the entire Mississippi Valley from uh, Minnesota to New Orleans and uh, west almost to the Rockies and east almost to the Appalachians. It would be quite a, quite a something. Um, Again, just a little bit of the of the uh, clear, of the knowledge about this, uh, and you'll see this came after um, <clears throat> after uh, Thoreau had died. Uh, a a Sponte Arrhenius of Sweden was the first chemistry Nobel laureate in chemistry in 1903. I'm trained as a chemist, and Arrhenius made immense contributions to chemistry, but his 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 contribution for the Nobel Prize was motivated by, in recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered by the advancement of chemistry by his electrolytic, electrolytic theory of dissociation, explaining why salt conducted electricity and sugar did not. Doesn't seem like a big deal today. But in 1896, he published the first research estimating how warm atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, how, how, uh, how atmospheric carbon dioxide would warm the earth by trapping the heat, and how much warmer it would be if the amount doubled. With a pencil and paper and the rather scant knowledge of the atmosphere, his results are very close to today. They're within a factor of two of what we're actually seeing with the amount of carbon dioxide um, and how much warming there is, and, um, and certainly in the right direction it was warming. 
Uh, by the way, Arrhenius is an ancestor of Greta Thunberg's father, who is also named Sponte. So she comes by it, I guess, genetically, you could say, her passion for climate change. So uh, what did Henry David say and when did he say it? Um, these are just, this, you know, 1870 to 1862, and he wrote different things at different times, and I'll be referring to those um, at, at the time. He does not appear to have heard or thought of global climate change, no surprise. Um, here's a, a, a photograph of him, a daguerreotype, um, in 1856 at age 41, and I read an account that said um, he was asked for this by some publicist or something who wanted to have his photo. And uh, it was uh, it was done for uh, uh, 50 cents. And he had been given $120, which he returned to the person who had uh, um, authorized the photograph. So he didn't know about climate change, but he had prescient comments that, that imply climate uh, that, that imply uh, climate and biodiversity solutions. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. So here's some things he said about forest. A people who would begin by burning the fences and let the forest stand. That was in Walking, which was a series of uh, lectures he gave uh, over about a 10 year period. A town is saved not more by the righteous men in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it, also in that same volume. Um, and then this famous phrase that I've always just found so profound uh, in Walden. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I mean, he was really, a remarkable thinker and uh, very self-aware. And uh, I like this one too. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. He's referring to the fine oaks and pines near his Walden Pond cabin in his journal. Um, but, but what a comment. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. Well, that's certainly true for forests and climate change. Um, so, um, on biodiversity, he had some things to say. He who cuts down woods beyond a certain limit exterminates birds. Well, just a couple of years ago, um, uh, this article appeared in Science Magazine, uh, a journal, scientific journal. Birds, 2.9 billion birds are gone since 1970 in North America. It's about 30% of all the birds, uh, just the number of animals gone. And um, this just shows by habitat. And the only ones that have increased are wetlands. And ironically, that's because uh, duck hunters in the Midwest have, uh, have uh, through Ducks Unlimited, have uh, developed large numbers of, um, of um, uh, or protected uh, large numbers of prairie potholes, uh, which are these wonderful um, uh, stopping off places for birds as they migrate uh, from south to north and north to south. Um, uh, on the continent. Um, what is the biggest loss is grassland birds. And that's because we've lost all, almost all our gra grasslands. But just above that are boreal forests. Those are in Alaska, western forests, and up here, eastern forests, which suggests that we're not taking very good care of our forests if this biodiversity is being lost. So what are our climate goals? Uh, in 1992, um, uh, governments of the world all got to together in Rio, and uh, that time I was I was uh, I had uh, from 1988 on is when I really got into climate change, and I was part of a group called um, World Resources Institute that with uh, the United Nations Environment Program um, uh, put together a plan. Um, the, the plan, and, and the, the, this language was actually drafted by George Woodwell, who was a really famous uh, scientist who, uh, both in climate, and he also is the discoverer of why uh, uh, the uh, um, why DDT was con bioconcentrating in, in uh, up the food chain to birds like pelicans and eagles and so on, hawks, and a million fold or more which physicists said couldn't be done, but you know, animals are living things and they managed to 
harvest a lot of these uh, chemicals because they concentrate in the fatty cells and it led to thin uh, birds eggs which um, uh, shells which meant that uh, not many of these species survived and he's the one who really paved the way to get rid of DDT and other toxic chemicals but he's also made huge contributions to uh, our understanding of, of the natural world's relationship to climate so the goal of this convention is to achieve a concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that will avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. That just means that uh, we want to get the amount of these, of, of the, 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 in addition to carbon dioxide, there's also methane gas and the, a lot of industrial gases and uh, nitrous oxide from fertilizer, all of which contribute to the trapping of heat. So we want to get the, whatever the constant, we want a concentration that will avoid dangerous interference with the climate system, human caused. And it took from 1992 to 2015 in Paris to get an agreement among governments, uh, which uh, I'll just read, read through it. Uh, agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius, that's 3.6 Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. And then in article five of that, parties should take action to conserve and enhance as appropriate sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases, including forests. So here we have all the countries in the world, every, every country in the world is a party to this uh, treaty, They're, meaning that they, they have, have ratified it. Uh, it's one of the, that and the ozone treaty are the, I think the only two treaties in the world that every country in the world belongs to. So unfortunately, global temperatures have already risen by 1.1 degrees Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit. So we have less than one degree Fahrenheit to go before we exceed one and a half degrees. And, um, and, and just a little over one and a half degrees uh, Fahrenheit to, get, to, to, to not exceed uh, uh, the two degrees. And the Arctic is warming four times as fast as the globe and changing weather patterns because the, the difference in temperature between the Arctic and the temperate uh, atmosphere is what drive weather. And uh, that has gotten less. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the mixing of air is following very, the jet stream and so on are following very different patterns. So governments, after boldly uh, making this statement after so many years after they said they'd do something and hadn't done anything, they had no idea how to get there. So they, they went to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I was not part of this. Um, and asked for a special report, which came out in 2018. And so here was the, here, here, here was, here's the words, and it'll contain some things you've heard about. To keep temperatures from rising excessively, global net anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions must decline by about 45% from 2005 levels by 2030, reaching net zero around 2050, and net negative beyond 2100. So a lot of you hear a lot of government uh, leaders and uh, business leaders saying, we're going to be uh, net zero by 2050. We have a lot of citizens groups that right here in Williamstown, we have a, a net zero uh, a committee. Um, but nobody reads the next next uh, line, which is and net negative beyond 2100, meaning by then we are removing more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we are putting than than we're than we're adding to it. Not only carbon dioxide, but enough carbon dioxide is being removed to account for the other other uh, heat trapping gases. And so we must simultaneously reduce carbon dioxide emissions and increase its removal from the atmosphere. Um, in order to get to this temperature, because we're already, I think, in dangerous territory. Um, I think that uh, having a goal which is hotter than uh, where we are now is a bit of a, a jip, actually. We should be uh, a little more aggressive than that, or in fact, quite a bit more aggressive than that. And if you'll bear with me, I just want to run through a few figures in a diagram that looks terribly complicated, but it's actually relatively simple. Basically, on the left, shows those circles at the bottom give the relative amounts of coal, oil, and gas reserves in carbon terms. And uh, uh, the emissions every year are something like 35 billion tons. That's what it said on that other graph I showed you earlier. Um, but 
uh, land, use change, land use changes, which means deforestation primarily and the destruction of soils and wetlands, is emitting around four. That's a pretty uncertain number. You see between two and seven. That's a big difference. And you'll see that the numbers only are missed by about a billion tons a year, uh, which sounds like a lot, but the uncertainty is, is very large there. Look at the, at the green dot under that called permafrost. Much, much more in permafrost than in um, um, probably uh, gas and oil reserves combined. And then look at the green dot next to it, soils, another big green dot. And um, uh, so um, that's 39 billion tons we're emitting of carbon dioxide. And the increase is only 19. Now, if, if somebody offered me a deal like that, that uh, I, I, I am, am uh, uh, somehow getting such a dramatic difference, of about 20 uh, billion tons a year, I'd ask what's going on. And what's going on is that the land is removing somewhere about 11 and oceans about 10, which is 21, which is not quite the same as, as uh, uh, the difference between 39 and 29, which is, which is it's off by one. But that's, that's the state of the science right now. And so here are some facts about forests. Forests account for 92% of all terrestrial biomass globally. That just means the amount of carbon, the living carbon, the carbon in living uh, organisms and in the soils. Forests store about 45% um, of all the organic carbon on land in their biomass and soils. So <clears throat> forests are really important if we want to keep carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, they remove the equivalent of about 30% of fossil fuel emissions annually uh, between 2009 and 2018. And 44% of that was by temperate forests. We hear a lot about tropical forests and they are important. But temperate and boreal forests together store, uh, 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 sorry, remove <coughs> and store uh, much more than do tropical forests. <coughs> And um, on a biodiversity note, that forests provide critical habitats to more than half of all known plant and animal species on Earth. And um, a, an Australian colleague of mine uh, corrected me when I pointed that this is what people were saying. And they said, no, it's the other way around. It's uh, the biodiversity that, that sustains a forest. A forest is not a forest if it's not biodiverse. And unfortunately, the official counting of what is forest includes plantations, which are just row crops of trees. So how do we increase removal of atmospheric carbon dioxide by forests? Well, we need to let more forests continue growing, as we'll see in a moment. So how do we remove the atmospheric carbon? Um, there is a lot of talk, and there are billions of dollars in the uh, legislation that was just passed on climate to have technological direct air capture. These are machines that will suck carbon dioxide out of the air. And carbon dioxide is about 0.04% of the atmosphere. And um, that means, means um, uh, 400, uh, it's actually 420 parts per million, 420 out of every molecules in the air, out of every million molecules is carbon dioxide. So here's what that looks like. Big machines like this, there are 19 of them capturing uh, uh, air and taking out the carbon today. Uh, nature's solution is to remove 11 billion tons a year. In other words, um, the removal by all natural systems about 11 billion tons. Um, and um, uh, proforestation, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is letting trees uh, continue to grow, uh, is one of the is 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 really what's making the system work. And uh, by the way, the 10,000 tons is about the annual emissions of 700 Americans. Uh, the 11 billion tons is equivalent of 833 million Americans, or three and a half, more than three and a half times the US population. It's probably the same as, as the population of the US, Canada, and Europe, who are large emitters. It's actually about the same as China. Uh, US has emitted. Um, much more than China over time, but China in its development is emitting more than the US today. So how do we get big trees, which turns out 
hold disproportionate amounts of carbon in them. Um, and, um, and this has really been the focus of much of my work is the uh, is, is building on this discovery that uh, in a forest, um, uh, almost well, if you look at the at the at the uh, relatively small number of big trees, they can hold uh, half or more of the carbon uh, that's in that whole forest. So how do we get big trees? We let more of them grow. There's a lot of talk about planting trees, and that's a nice thing to do, but they won't look like this by 2030 or by 2050 or by 2100. And um, so um, some colleagues and I, as we look, read all this and began talking about it, realized that what's being left out, when you look at these analyses that say forest won't do very much to remove carbon, is because they're talking about planting trees. And that's true. Planting trees will just not remove much carbon because the trees are too little. You see those little trees in the background in this picture? There's just not a lot of carbon in each of these little slender trunks, but there's a lot in this one. And um, so uh, the larger trees, trees um, at, at, at the proforestation management is growing forest without harvest to reach their potential for biodiversity and carbon accumulation in trees and soils. And larger trees and older and growing forests accumulate the most atmospheric carbon over time and store it in the wood of, the, of their trunk and uh, their limbs and in soils. So since trees are about half carbon by weight, that's where it all going. It's amazing. Trees, these big wooden things, um, are made out of air <laughs> and water uh, and, and uh, sunlight. Uh, is the energy force that puts that all together. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about natural climate solutions to climate change, which is a forest ecosystem service. It's a service provided to us for free by forests. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a was part of a, 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 a piece that uh, Beverly Law and I published in the conversation. Keeping trees in the ground where they are already growing is an effective, low-tech way to slow climate change. And what caught my eye was some of these papers at the end of the, of the 20 teens. Um, altering forest management to let more trees grow would allow global forests to accumulate twice as much carbon. Just think about that. They're already removing something almost 30% of what we put in from everything every year. And uh, that would, uh, would increase enough to double the amount of carbon that's stored in, uh, in, in our forest. And this other sort of blew my mind uh, bit of research, the largest 1% of trees in mature and older forests comprise 50% of forest biomass worldwide. Um, Jim Lutz out at uh, Utah State University uh, with, uh, they visited, uh, I think it was 48 forests of all types around the world. And uh, they measured uh, millions of trees. And when they say the largest, they mean the largest volume trees, not necessarily the tallest, but the, the ones that have the biggest volume holding the most carbon. And uh, so in this picture, a big tree like this is holding a lot of the carbon that's in this whole forest. And, um, um, another interesting paper came out in 2020 is that the potential for growing forests to accumulate carbon by natural regrowth is better than active management and has been underestimated by a third. Um, and uh, so these are all things that came together. And, um, and just to give you an example, um, the western part of your state, Massachusetts, is at the center of high density carbon forests in the eastern um, uh, United States the Northeastern United States. Green means lots of carbon per acre. Uh, purple means very uh, only a third as much. And you can see that this uh, area here, this is, is a huge uh, green blob, dark green blob. Southern New Hampshire, Vermont, Western Massachusetts, Northwest Connecticut. Uh, that's the largest uh, high density uh, forest in, uh, in the Northeast. This is the other high density, which is the Adirondacks, which has been protected in the uh, Constitution of New York State since the 1890s. So three times as much carbon per acre here as there is in all these areas of Maine, northern uh, 
New Hampshire, northern Vermont, and this upstate New York uh, area here. Um, I just gave a presentation uh, uh, this uh, this morning um, to uh, the Vermont Forest Count. Uh, what's it called? Council or something that is a state uh, uh, designated thing. Just pointing out that. There is right here in Burlington a uh, major wood burning power plant, and there's not going to be a lot of wood left to keep it going. So another interesting thing, uh, Bill Keaton up at the University of Vermont is in the uh, forestry school, uh, concludes that New England forests can store between 2.4 and 4.3 times current um, rates uh, or amounts it should be. Uh, well. I mean, here we already have a lot, but I think it's because this area is so poor. Uh, but we could add a lot more here as well because our forests are basically a bunch of juveniles. Uh, the, uh, I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Now, believe it or not, the tallest tree in Northeast US is located in Western Massachusetts. It's 176 feet tall, measured in 2018 by Bob Leverett. Those of you, some of you know Bob, he's a remarkable person. He's a retired engineer from the Air Force, and he took up the interest in finding uh, remnants of old growth forest in the Northeast and, and uh, the, uh, down into the uh, Smoky Mountains. And he founded the um, uh, Native Tree Society, and he's a co-founder of that. And he specializes in measuring big trees. When he was younger, he used to climb up to the top of a 176-foot tree and drop a tape measure down. But now he does it with uh, laser instruments. And so here's the, here are the statistics on this um, uh, in 50-year increments of this um, old white pine uh, that, that's actually about 160 years old now. And in the first 50 years, it added 8 tenths of a ton of carbon. In the second, by the second 50 years, it, it was up to uh, 1.2 tons. And in the third, it uh, was 1.8. And you can see that the absolute addition from 0.8 to about 1.09 or something is bigger in the, in the second 50 years than in the first. And it's much bigger still in the third 50 years. So there's been this myth going around that uh, trees are all about to be, are, are becoming senile and dying, so we better harvest them. Um, it turns out that if this tree had been harvested at 50 years when it was perfect for the sawmill, uh, it would have missed 70% uh, of, the, of the carbon it would have added after that time. So we need, we need to protect more trees, uh, to let them grow to be big trees. Uh, these are data from a whole stand of white pines in uh, the Mohawk Trail State Forest. Let's just look at the triangles here. Uh, this is how many, um, the, the, how much carbon was added in tons. So you start out here essentially at zero. This was a, this was this area was totally cleared for sheep sheep uh, culture. Uh, Thoreau had a great statement about this: about uh, humans think it's necessary to. Uh, um, uh, to, to turn the land into, into giant sh uh, sheep pasture, pastures before it can be of value. Because it was about 18, uh, up to the 1850s when the sheep uh, uh, economy collapsed. Uh, but it went from, so this, this was just a, a, a bunch of pine trees that seeded, and you see it happening today in abandoned fields. And it was, um, um, so let's call it zero there. And then this just shows at 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, you get up here to something something like 75 or 76 uh, tons in a single acre. At the same time, the total number of trees peaked at, at around 38 uh, in this case. Um, and um, I'm sorry, this is, this is uh, uh, yeah, about 38, and, it, and then it dropped down to 40. I, I, I miss made a mistake when I put this in here. That was for a different study that was done, and I didn't think which one it was. Um, so um, fewer trees, but much more carbon, and still going up. And white pine can live to be about 300 years. And so these trees are about halfway through their lifetime if they're allowed to keep growing and don't get a disease or killed by fire or drought. Um, 
to make this point about the difference between big trees and little trees, I asked Bob if he would put together something that based on the measurements and the uh, data from the uh, US Forest Service. And so he took a single uh, uh, very, very large uh, uh, red oak that's about 100 feet tall, but its trunk is very big around, 54 inches in diameter. And, um, and said, well, suppose you had, uh, how many trees half that height would it take to equal the carbon in this one? And it turns out it's 35 trees. And 50 foot tall pine tree is a pretty big tree. If it's just 40 inches, and you'll notice that it gets much, much uh, smaller in diameter, it's 151 trees to have the same carbon as this one big tree. And if you get newly planted landscape trees that are 25 feet tall, it takes 465 of those to have the same carbon. So when a developer says, well, I got to take out that big tree or the town says, I want to clear, take that uh, uh, big, uh, uh, this happened in, in uh, I think it was in, in Concord, uh, that, uh, or no, it was in Newton, I guess. Uh, this big, uh, <clears throat> well, it, it's happened in all these cities. Cambridge was really notorious for taking out big trees. But don't worry, we'll plant a tree. No, I'll tell you what, I'll plant two trees for every one I take out. It doesn't come close on the carbon scale uh, to replacing it. <clears throat> Here's another study done by um, Professor Beverly Law and colleagues out in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Oregon uh, and found that uh, if we um, just restricted harvest on, on all the forests there by half, we would accumulate an additional 150 million tons of carbon. On the other hand, if we reforest all these patches here of overcut lands by planting trees today, you'll only have about 50, maybe 60. And if we plant everywhere that is already not having, uh, not already has a forest on it and uh, is not urban land or is not agricultural land, we would have less than 20. So letting forests grow is really key to uh, uh, removing more carbon uh, in the time frame we have. And these are just a couple of pictures, by the way. Here's Bob Leverett measuring um, a large, uh, uh, a large uh, pine in uh, Mohawk Trail State Forest. And uh, this is just someone here look at it in part of that stand I described earlier. It's uh, it's pretty impressive that <clears throat> we have a forest like that in Massachusetts. So, um, um, what Thoreau's observations reveal about climate change today? So, he was an excellent observation naturalist, as you know, he kept extensive records. And you all know about Richard Premack at Boston University, who compared Thoreau's observations on plants uh, to current conditions at, at uh, Walden. And uh, here are some of the findings 27% of the flowers around uh, his stomping grounds have vanished since the mid-19th century, and another 36% are on the brink of disappearing. Not surprisingly, these are the plants that are more favored in northerly climates as the, or as the, as the Walden Pond has gotten warmer. Uh, uh, on every spring morning from 1851 to 1858, uh, he uh, explored the woods around the pond, noting the first seasonal blooms of 465 species of flower. Imagine that. We did this over a seven year period. And um, the uh, review found that 27% uh, of the, well, that they're now a month um, uh, earlier blooming. And um, one of the things that always fascinated me in Walden was his description of the ice cover and uh, his disdain for the uh, uh, men who came to cut the ice and uh, put it on a ship and ship it all the way to the Orient, all the way to, to, to China, because there was no ice there, and to India, uh, and to the Northeast, uh, other parts of the Northeast. We were clearly getting this, this trade, and then they would bring back things like, uh, um, from, from, from China, uh, porcelain that was just miraculously beautiful and unknown uh, to uh, uh, people here in, uh, in Boston. Boston became a big, a big uh, sink for Chinese porcelain. Uh, but the fact they would pack the ice in, in uh, sawdust and only about a quarter of it would ever get there, but the prices that were paid were so high. And Thoreau had real disdain for that kind of money making. 
Um, nature needs half. This is a, a statement, and I'll, I'll tell you by who in just a moment. Protecting and interconnecting at least half of the planet's land and water is necessary to sustain the health, function, and diversity of all life. And the person who made that statement is E.O. Wilson, the co-founder co with uh, Tom Lovejoy of Biodiversity Science. And uh, unfortunately, they died within one day of each other, Christmas Day and the day after uh, this past year. Um, interestingly enough, um, I'm sure that's a somewhat arbitrary number, but in the uh, IPCC report that, uh, that just came out, the sixth assessment report, uh, in it, it says that uh, there is a general agreement uh, that in order to uh, address climate change and biodiversity, uh, we must set aside between 30 and 50% of land for that purpose. And so um, let more grow, uh, prevent deforestation, restore degraded, degraded ecosystems, and practice proforestation. It's far more efficient, effective than planting a trillion trees and is among the least costly options for removing and storing additional carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And create climate and biodiversity strategic reserves to do this. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, here in New England, we don't have very much protected land. The red areas are either national parks, uh, wilderness areas in New Vermont, New Hampshire, Baxter State Park, Park in Maine, uh, and then um, um, Acadia National Park on the coast of Maine and in Massachusetts. It's the only forest that is legally protected are the forests in Cape Cod National Seashore. So here in Massachusetts, just a little over 1% is fully protected by law. And the yellow are the remaining intact forests. It's only three and a half percent. There's a lot of forest, but it's all been cut over many times. We've been cutting this forest for 400 years. And so we need more legally protected land. And the Forest Service finds that 95% uh, of New England forests are less than 100 years old. And our trees can live at least three times that long, many of our species. So we need more old forests. Uh, and the only way to get them is to let the medium age ones grow and protect the old ones we have. So what we can do is establish two kinds of forests, strategic climate and biodiversity reserves. These are two prominent uh, uh, forest carbon scientists, uh, Richard Ski Houghton on the left and uh, Wayne Walker on the right. Uh, they do a lot. Uh, Wayne does uh, remote sensing to find forests and uh, Ski has done the the, uh, has developed the main means by which we keep track of the carbon in forests. And then we need to create, we will have industrial production forests. And, and the outcome of that looks like this. These two pictures were taken about 20 miles from each other. So we have to decide how many of these forests are we going to protect and how much we're going to have in production. And um, so here are some of Thoreau's final all-encompassing statements. What is the use of a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? If, and that was in a letter to H.G.O. Blake in 1860. If that's not a summary of the condition we're in right now, I don't know what is. Uh, if we are prosecuted for abusing children, others deserve to be prosecuted for maltreating the face of nature committed to their care. That's in his journal. Uh, the trees indeed have hearts. Wouldn't he be, he would not be the least bit surprised at the recent research showing that uh, the, um, uh, the mycorrhizomes, the fungal networks underground connect trees and that they communicate with them. He believed they had a heart, the equivalent of a heart. And we also know that they, they actually breathe. They get bigger and smaller as they breathe to pump water up. Them. And then uh, this was, I just thought a really profound insight because it's so uh, relevant to today. If we knew all the laws of nature, we should need only one fact or the description of one actual phenomenon to infer all the particular results at that point. Now we know only a few laws and our result is vitiated, not of course by any confusion or irregular, irregularity in nature, but by our ignorance of essential elements in the cal calculation. That was true then, we know more now, but there's still a lot we don't know. And uh, and that's why you'll hear these great debates among scientists as to why the climate is changing so radically and so much more rapidly than they originally thought. Because
because they only had a limited amount of knowledge when they made their pre or previous um, uh, projections. And finally, his most famous statement probably is, uh, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. That was um, really wonderful um, and enlightening. And we already have a bunch of questions. So I'm just going to jump right in if you're okay, okay with that. Sure. Um, so the first one, can you talk about bulldozing and using heavy equipment to alter a historical wetlands ecosystem in the name of restoration? Isn't it harmful in terms of carbon, carbon release to dig up the soils to turn one kind of wetland ecosystem into another? Yes. <laughs> I also work with a group of wetland scientists, including a former student of mine who 30 years after I had her as an undergraduate, called me and said, would you come and talk to a wetland scientist about climate change? And uh, we, we, now there's this really big group within the Society of Wetland Scientists uh, working on climate. Um, this notion that we can have net zero loss of wetlands is, uh, is, is, is a myth. Uh, once you, the, the time asymmetry is extraordinary. Uh, the amount of carbon that's stored in the soils of uh, wetland it could have taken 10,000 years to get there. It will be released with that bulldozer in a matter of weeks or months. So then it's also the question of plumbing, underground plumbing. You can't just go dig a ditch, a hole somewhere else, put some water in it and throw in a few plants that are wetland plants. That is not restoring a wetland. We know very little of how to actually do that. I mean, if, if it takes tens, decades and centuries to form a wetland as a real functional ecosystem, we're destroying them in a day. And uh, we've lost more than half the wetlands we have. And even with the remaining wetlands, I, again, I learned these fascinating things working with these people. Um, uh, wetlands are about 6% uh, of the total land area. They hold 30% of the soil carbon in the world. So if you're just, you know, that's just insane to be destroying that. Yeah, yeah, that was a really great question. question. Um, yeah, may have missed this. Why do larger and older trees store more carbon than a large number of younger, smaller trees? Well, I mean, you can get enough, enough, enough smaller trees to hold the same amount, but they can't grow in the same space as that large tree. I mean, there's just, you, you can't put... Um, uh, 465 little little 25 foot trees in the same area that uh, is taken up by one big tree, and so you have to. That means you have to plant them, and we know that that's going to take a long time to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just the case that uh, uh, I mean, big trees are remarkably efficient in in uh, in their operation. They're also less vulnerable to climate change. After all, uh, you know uh, the. This whole area and this area you see behind me, which is the Williamstown Valley looking from uh, up on the, on the New York state line, uh, uh, was, was under, under uh, ice uh, just 11,000 years ago. There was no forest here at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came back. I mean, the, the chestnuts were the last trees to migrate back and that was 500 years ago. And then we've killed them all off after 450 years or something. Um, but um, uh, with, with, with the uh, chestnut blight. Um, but it's amazing how, but, but we're too impatient, you know, nature takes her time and these forests have survived in that time, all kinds of wild fluctuations in the climate or in the weather at least, and they're still around. And the bigger trees have deeper roots, they can withstand drought better, they have thicker barks, they're more fire resistant. And the fact that they're here means that they've been through a lot of uh, d diseases and insect infestations, gypsy moths. How many times do you think these trees have been, been defoliated by gypsy moths and they're still around? Yeah, I think, I think of Walden Woods too. Um, the students are always surprised that the trees are only, most trees are only 70 to 100 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you know? they're, they're children. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they are. And yet I overheard some of, uh, I went to a conference, I overheard two foresters saying the average trees in the forest in, in Massachusetts are 70 years old. Uh, they're way, they're, they're way over mature. And I said, what? <laughs> 70 years is over mature. Well, from an economic point of view, it's over mature. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that was revelation. Revelation, yes. <laughs> uh, so you speak of largest trees in a forest sequestering the most CO two. Does the same rule go for large trees in suburbia? Those yes. that tend to break and blow over in the ever more powerful storms. Um, perhaps yeah. create a bylaw to replace one with 465 new landscape trees. <laughs> <laughs> La layered question comment. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, it, yes, indeed. Some of these big trees get knocked down. There's, there's one one tree in this uh, pine tree in this group of 76 that I know of in, 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 as a group, um, which had actually been named uh, Thoreau's tree. Unfortunately, it was hit by lightning. I stood up taller than the other trees and it got hit by lightning. Uh, that's happened from time immemorial that trees get knocked down and so on. But it's a really small number compared to other things. A study done by the Forest Service said that if you take into account all the losses that occur, wind storms and diseases and fires and everything else, um, uh, it's, it's only about um, uh, 15 per, and, and land conversions, deforestation in the United States, it's only about 15% of the emissions that come from from, uh, um, from forests and, and the other 85% is from logging because way less than half of the, of the, of the uh, weight of a tree ends up as boards because, mm -hmm. you know, the branches don't get used and the trunks don't get used and you got to square a round cross section and there's a lot of sawdust generated. And um, so talking about storing carbon in wood is, is, is uh, yes, some get stored in wood for a while, but there, it, it, there's more carbon dioxide emitted in a short period of time than is stored in that wood from that tree that's been, been cut. So the next question, a um, little bit of background. I attended a number of years back an outdoor lecture at Walden Woods and they talked about crossbreeding trees, such as the elm, which suffer from the Dutch elm disease. Mm -hmm. By cross-pollinating them with the Chinese elm variant, they were able to preserve the native species in a hybrid variant. My question is whether climate change scientists are working to not only preserve the forest, such as the elm, but also creating hybrid versions to combat the CO2 changes. Yeah, I mean, there are attempts to do that. Um, by the way, they, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there are a number of magnificent elms still standing in towns all over the place. Those have natural immunity. And um, I heard a wonderful lecture by a person who works on this, and he said there are, in fact, uh, three different forms of immunity in the elms that survived. And instead of uh, genetically modifying and trying to change them or do, doing something or, or, or crossbreed with Chinese elms, they're crossbreeding the different American elms to get multiple um, resistance to um, uh, Dutch elm disease. Um, so I, I, you know, the reason we, we can't do that with chestnuts is because they were all cut down. Hey, they're dying. Let's cut them all down. We're hearing the same thing now with hemlock. Woolly adelgid is going to kill all the hemlocks. Let's go cut them all down now. If we do that, we'll never know if, if some of them might sur might survive, you know, and it, we may be down to 10 of them or 100 or 1,000, but they will come back, um, at least against that set of, of threats. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we have uh, there, there are a lot, lot, lot of ways to, to try to do this. And what is the lifespan of a pine? I often hear it's old. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, 300 years is a possibility. Um, the oldest ones we're seeing here in New England are about 200 years old. Because, uh, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, it was 80% cleared by about, what, 20, or 19, or 1850. And then uh, uh, the sheep culture ended and, um, and uh, um, well, beginning with the opening of the uh, Northwest Territories, meaning Ohio, uh, Massachusetts farmers were intelligent enough to know that it was easier to cut down a forest there and not have to farm rocks every year for the rest of your life. And that's the abandoned agriculture. And the reason that Mass Western Massachusetts and, and uh, Southern Vermont and New Hampshire are so carbon rich is that there was benign neglect after that, meaning that it was just abandoned. 
everybody left. And uh, so we have these forests that are approaching 200 years here, or bits of the forest that are approaching 200 years. And, um, and we've never seen trees that big and old in, in the Northeast before. So it's a, it's a wonderful experience to, uh, to know that they're still around. Of the primary forest in Massachusetts, Bob Leverett estimates it's about 1,400 acres in bits and patches out of, out of 3 million of forests. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we'll take a few more questions. So if anyone has a pressing question, put it in the Q&A box um, before it's too late. Uh, so is the carbon stored in most trees stored in the part above the ground or below? That is, is there a ratio of carbon in trunks and limbs versus carbon in the root, root system? Yes, there, there's a, a rough, rough uh, estimate depending on the type of tree, but um, uh, basically, uh, if you look at the amount that's in the in the above ground growing tree, and uh, uh, and you just look at the at the trunk, uh, and then you add fifteen percent to that, plus or minus ten percent, uh, that's the branches, and another fifteen percent to the roots as a rough. Uh, the, the roots are about the same as the branches in most trees, and so you take what you measure on the trunk and you or the bowl and you. Uh, uh, add 30% to it, and that gives you a, a you know pretty good estimate of how much is there. What's interesting is in an older forest, even we're seeing this in these these, these remnant patches of 200-year-old forests, the soils hold as much carbon as the standing trees. And in older, really old forests, uh, old-growth forests, primary forests, it's more than half. Uh, that's true for the for the uh, boreal forests in Alaska and Canada. And it's true in even more true there. It's, it's, there's much more in the in the soil there than in the trees. And in our forest in this temperate zone, it's it can it can easily get up to be uh, equal amounts of in the of, of more in the soil than in the trees. Great. Yeah, these are all really good questions. You're excellent. Learning. Yeah, learning a lot about trees <laughs> that I didn't know before. Um, so we'll do one more question, uh, which is a little different. Uh, how do you stay motivated to make a difference on fighting climate change? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? You know, it's yeah, just, uh, tricky. <laughs> I say to my students, you know, I've been doing this for, uh, uh, you know, since uh, 1988 exclusively and, uh, and on climate and uh, you can see how successful I've been. Um, and uh, uh, what keeps me going is I know that uh, there are more solutions to addressing climate change than there are problems. And uh, what gives me the most hope is when I, I stumbled on the, on the notion, I'm a physical scientist, you know, so I think about technology and stuff and I built a house based on that and it really does work. I hmm. export more solar electricity that I, that I uh, bring in at night. So I don't have batteries. And I'm, I, I checked the other day in my app and, uh, 60% uh, of the miles driven in my electric vehicle are, are from my own rooftop. <laughs> and and the only time reason 40% isn't is because I drive someplace else where I have to charge at the other end, go to Boston mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and so um, I know there's 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 plenty of technology to do the uh, to reduce the emissions. And what's given me the most hope was was discovering um, not just that I knew that the natural world played this role, but what really got me motivated was to start thinking about how would we increase that removal by natural systems. And um, I, I, I began espousing these ideas and suddenly people who study this stuff started talking to me and uh, we, we sort of formed a partnership and it's been wonderful. And uh, then I've got to meet, I've been able to meet people like Bob Leverett and Mike, Michael Pellet and others who have been at this for much longer than I have. Yeah. And um, and it's it's uh, it's it really uh, that's what gives me hope is that I know that this works and I know how well it works and I know this is the least expensive thing to do and you don't have to buy new land to plant trees on right this is already a forest and so what's <laughs> not to like about it and yet there are billions of dollars in the uh, in the legislation that just passed for uh, direct air capture by technology. And there's billions of dollars to cut down more in our national forests. Mm -hmm. Ex explain to me why why that. Well, it's simple. The uh, 
as someone someone cynical friend of mine said, you know, America has the best government money can buy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's unfortunately the case. And so the uh, uh, fossil fuel industry and the forestry industry are able to get these ridiculous things into the legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, great answer. It seems the beginning part of that, something that Thoreau would do to hold himself accountable. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Bill and Michael. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and again, Mel Bill and Michael who, who made it happen. Um, and lastly, the Walton Woods Project and Restore have been offering our virtual events for free um, and we will continue to do so. We have two more together this fall and one in winter 2023. Uh, you can find those at walden.org and register. And if anyone wants or can make a donation to either or both nonprofits, we would be so very grateful. Um, but mostly we just thank you for continuing to show up and we look forward to seeing hopefully all of you at the future events we have. Um, and I put the donate links in the chat, uh, but of course, no pressure. Um, and with that, we will we will wrap it up. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. I really feel honored to be asked for Walden Woods. I, it, yeah, well, it we brought, feel honored. <laughs> it, brought, it brought me back to uh, just the, my dis uh, back to my discovery of Thoreau uh, years ago, and yeah, uh, and it's my continuing relation with him. In his, uh, uh, you know, if if there had been bumpers in his day, he would have written the ultimate bumper stickers. Yeah. <laughs> A pithy little statement that you can say. Yeah, <laughs> so true. Remarkable. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're in the area, stop by. We actually have, you might know this, the original daguerreotype that you showed in our library collections. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, so we can oh, let you cool. hold it if you want. <laughs> oh, that'd be wonderful. I, I, love, I love, I just thought that's such a great picture of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's the only one, too. Yeah, yes. Yep. Oh, there's three. Is there three? Oh, there's three. Three. Yeah. One All of right. three is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> All so right, thank you. Don't give up hope, people. Keep just thinking of ways that you, you can make a difference in your town. Um, there's been big battles in, in every place from Newton to Northampton about city trees. And uh, uh, there's always somebody who wants to take down that great big one that's 150 years old. And, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and, and put in a parking lot or a, you know something like that. Uh, yeah. What's the line from the song? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Yep. Dirty yep. metric song. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. keep, keep at it. Yeah. Thank you and thank you. Keep at the. Thank you for doing the good work and you as well, Michael. Thank you. Yep. Thanks everyone. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. all right. Hi.